Oh, we'll I see. see. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. I think uh, some people are still uh, coming in. Uh, we are recording this. Um, we are hope you got a chance to watch the film. And if you didn't get a chance to watch the film, and I'll say this at the end, uh, you have up till the 31st of this month to watch it, uh, if you didn't get a chance. Uh, but thanks for being part of the Q&A. And we welcome your questions. Uh, you can put them into the chat, uh, I guess, is the easy, is so Marky uh, can look at one place to find them, maybe. I don't know if that's any different than the Q&A. But uh, so let's get started, because there's plenty to talk about. And we have only an hour to talk about. So I'd like to welcome, first of all, our guest, uh, Greg Coleridge. He's the Outreach Director of Move to Amend. He's the author of Citizens Over Corporations, A Brief History of Democracy in Ohio and Challenges to Freedom in the Future. He's a writer of the documentary Corp or Nation, the story of, a, of citizens and corporations in Ohio. And he's contributed several articles to the anthology Defying uh, uh, Corporations, Defining Democracy, a book of history and strategy. And he currently maintains and distributes via email a weekly real democracy history calendar and monetary history calendar. So delighted to have you, Greg. Uh, I, I'm Bill Lyons, uh, uh, current president of the Ohio Community Rights Network. Uh, our, just to tell you uh, briefly, uh, our mission is to establish a network of just communities working to advance, secure, and protect the inalienable rights of all Ohioans to democratic local self-governance to sustainable food, energy, and economic systems, and the rights of nature to exist and flourish throughout Ohio. And also as uh, OHCRN and Simply Living, uh, co-sponsors of this film series, this is our third one, and we're going to have one more, and we'll talk about briefly that at the end. Uh, Simply Living, uh, Chuck Lind is here, and um, Simply Living, uh, their mission statement, and of course, encourage you to look up their website, simplyliving.org. It's a community organization that celebrates and connects people to learning opportunities that promote community sustainability, environmental awareness, and our local economy through educational outreach and partnerships within our community. So that's exactly what they're doing. So, uh, Greg, I thought that not, we don't want to assume that everybody knows about Move to Amend, so maybe you can give us a, a short explanation first to start off about uh, who Move to Amend is. Sure. Well, thank you so much, uh, Bill, for the um, invitation and uh, uh, for everyone else to be on this call today on a summer afternoon uh, weekend. So uh, very impressed. Move to Amend is a coming up on 12 year old organization got uh, going the very day of the Citizens United 2010 uh, Supreme Court decision. Uh, its goal is to um, try to bring about what we call a 28th constitutional amendment to create for the very first time, uh, in part, it's not a magic bullet, but would contribute toward the creation of an authentic democracy by through this amendment, uh, abolishing two constitutional doctrines. One is uh, money, political money and elections being equivalent to First Amendment uh, free speech. And the second is uh, sort of the main subject matter of this film that hopefully all of you saw, eliminating in all of its various forms, never intended inalienable constitutional rights for corporate entities. So we're a, a multicultural, intergenerational, and uh, seek to build uh, along with others an authentic democracy movement of which this would be a piece of uh, what needs to happen. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think uh, just a uh, brief slogan is corporations aren't people and money's not speech. And I think the majority of Americans would agree with that. So uh, this, that would be a big step to get that. Um, I'd like to yeah, just uh, start with the film. And the film begins by mentioning that the Enlightenment uh, was about freeing us to think for ourselves and govern ourselves, and in essence, real democracy. Uh, but it mentions at the end of the 20th century and 
perhaps started before, that uh, the, uh, was the beginnings of starting to consider society, humans, and nature as market commodities. So uh, Greg, I just wanted your thoughts on, on that and the, the start of the state of how we got where we are maybe. Yeah, well, where we are is not a very pretty place, is it? And certainly uh, the beginning of the film and talking about everything increasingly becoming market, market, marketized, econom, economized, and commodified is certainly true. And uh, later on in the film, it talks about we're less a uh, market economy uh, than we are a market society. And mm. that is just so true with yeah. everything being seen through the lens or through the prism of putting a price tag, uh, de de uh, diminishing the public in favor of the private or of the corporate. And that certainly is not how it once was. You know, we are creatures that yes, there is a part of us and it's a very valid and, and important part. We are in part individuals, but we wouldn't be around if we were not in part also part of a community, mm -hmm. part of something larger than ourselves in which we need other human beings to form a community to exist. And of course, we wouldn't exist if not being able to maintain and sustain a natural world around us. So mm -hmm. existing in harmony with the natural world has been a defining characteristic of what 99%, 99.9% of human existence. It's really mm -hmm. only over the past two centuries that somehow we've gotten into this notion of, you know, we are above and beyond nature. They, nature exists for our own benefit and we can plunder people, we can plunder the planet to hell with everybody else. And let's figure out how to commodify and privatize and corporatize everything for profit and for unending growth. Mm, yeah, well, that, that uh, leads into uh, something I'd like to speak about what uh, our organization, Ohio Community Rights Network, uh, stands for is uh, one about, well, the film talks about we need to learn from movements at the end and uh, about sustained efforts. And uh, there is, uh, we're part of what's called the community rights movement. And like you mentioned, we live in communities and we can't just think of ourselves as individuals, a dog eat dog uh, world all out for ourselves because we don't really live like that. And so uh, community rights and the rights of nature, you mentioned as well, uh, that uh, so community rights saying that uh, communities should have the right to enact and enforce local laws for their health, safety and welfare free from state preemption, which is a ever increasing practice, uh, as long as they're not taking away rights of natural persons, not corporate persons from uh, uh, that are listed in our constitutions state and federal, and rights of nature saying that uh, nature, and we're part of it, like you mentioned, ha should have the right to exist and, and flourish and not be polluted and destroyed because doing so, as we know with our climate uh, crisis, that we're destroying ourselves. So yeah, I think that fits quite well with, um, I think, what you're saying. And I know that uh, the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund uh, which uh, Tish O'Dell is the Ohio representative uh, and uh, move to a man have had uh, some uh, work together uh, on some things, right? Yeah. So any thoughts on? Uh, well, you're absolutely right in terms of, and you know, there's some really wonderful aspects and elements of this film. If you've seen it, it's great. If you haven't had a chance to do it, it's, it's wonderful that the producers are allowing um, an extension for a few more days to see it. So I highly recommend doing it. There's really some great pieces uh, to it. But, you know, I think um, there's a couple of, of what I would call blind spots. Mm. In it. And, and one of them has to do with what, you know, you, Bill, just talked about and certainly what the uh, Community Rights Network in Ohio and around the country and what Cell Death and Move to Amend has tried to focus on, at least in part, that this film, you know, just sort of touches on, but it really doesn't dig deep into. And that's the whole issue of, I mean, it starts with, you know, doing this psychological diagnosis, building on the first film, which 
I don't know if people had a chance to see the first film, but if you haven't, go back and do so. I think it's it's out there. If it's not, you know, online, a lot of libraries have it now. You know, but the original film looks at okay, if a corporation is a person, it's it's pathological. All right, let's look at it from that framework. Uh, and they added a new development, which is pretty cool. We can get into that. But that's sort of where it begins and kind of where it ends in the whole notion of personhood and mm -hmm. corporate entities being persons. And mm -hmm. if they are, which they are as the Supreme Court, when they were, you know, with a straight face, multiple times declaring that, you know, the social movements that were described don't really, in the film, which, you know, many of them very good, have been very successful as far as they've gone, but none of those have really front and center focused exclusively or even, even sort of tangentially on that notion of getting rid of corporate personhood. Mm. Um, and so I, you know, I was a little disappointed, quite frankly, in yeah. that lack of attention to that because they have a whole section of democracy in crisis, but they never overtly say, well, one of the reasons why, you know, there's hate and division and scapegoating, all right, there's, you know, increasing economic inequality and all these other problems, ain't it off that's depicted in the film, but they never connect the dots. Mm. I don't think adequately to the fact that these entities rule. I mean, they yeah. talk about in general, they've gotten to the point of where they not only, you know, have the power to sell things, but also govern. Well, why is it that they, in fact, have gotten the power to govern? It's because of these never intended inalienable rights mm. that they have won and that they have abused uh, to the detriment of people, places, and the planet. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because, uh, yes, you're right, that because corporations have been considered persons and they've gained uh, the uh, first, what, first, fourth, fifth, and 14th amendments, is that the, the, uh, the uh, ones that they've kind of used to their advantage? I don't know if I'm leaving one out or not, but I believe I have the right ones. Uh, maybe you can give a, a short example of some outrageous, and of course there's so many, how they have uh, used these uh, one or more of these rights to extract from the public good uh, things that should be ours. You know, in the in the film, it it uh, talks about in many places, and it's tremendous that there has been this movement led by, um, you know, the recently, uh, fairly recently elected uh, representative in Seattle, uh, representative uh, councilwoman uh, Sawant. Uh, talking about raising the, the minimum wage uh, in uh, city of Seattle, first community to do that. You know, other communities have tried to do that and some somewhat successful, but you know, one of the, the pushbacks by the corporate crowd has been, as you well know, at the community rights level, whether it's the, you know, community rights networks or CELDEF that, you know, one of the go-to uh, reactions and powers and tools that corporate entities have is preemption, is to shift decision making from one level of government to another to just overturn democratically enacted laws. Wow. And that preemption can take two forms. Either they try at the legislative level to preempt. Uh, so, you know, city council passes something, nice try, because then the state level state um, uh, assembly, uh, you know, uh, house, senate will overturn that signed by the governor, forget it. Uh, so that's one way. The other is they go to court and say, you don't have a right to do that because hmm. it's violating any number of constitutional uh, rights, so, so to speak. And so, you know, the film talks about the corporate, new corporate playbook. And if you saw it, I thought it was very good. There are nine yeah. of them, but just saying, I don't want to, sidetrack this, but, you know, if you sort of get into the history of how corporate entities um, initially amass their power, they, they amass their power by preempting, if you will, the control that we, the people and those we elected, relatively speaking, you know, the democratic system, um, in controlling corporate entities through the charter, 
at the state level as corporate charters that initially defined what companies could and could not do. Well, the original playbook of corporate entities to get rid of that controlling mechanism were really three tools. One is they said, hey, we don't like what states are doing in using these charters to define what we can and cannot do. We're going to go to the federal level and get the federal government to pass laws that preempt what goes on at the state level. Or instead of being sued in state courts, we're going to you know, say that uh, this should be heard at a federal court level. So it's a lot harder, is it not, back in the 1800s to sort of go to you know, Washington, D.C. to lobby for or against something um, that is um, preserving democratic self-governance when it used to be done at the state level. So if you can preempt by, by creating this escape mechanism, that's how they escaped democratic control, um, why not? So that's one way they escaped, so to speak, democratic control. Second way is they sought to shift decision-making from the legislative arena, because again, corporate charters were defined by the legislature. They sought to remove that decision-making from the legislative arena to the regulatory arena. Now we tend to think, right? Oh, regulatory agencies, they're for the people. Well, you know better, you know, the committee rights networks, LDF and the like. Hey, regulatory agencies regulate activism. That's about it. Mm -hmm. And even if perchance accidentally, they are strongly and harshly acting in the public interest and against corporations, they can always go to court mm. uh, and sort of overturn those regulations. But then the third way they escape democratic control through the charters is they sought to escape the defining what companies could not, could not do um, at the state level, legislative uh, arena, and go to the courts, mm. i.e. the Supreme Court. Mm. And that's where you got these never intended, bizarre corporate constitutional rights. And so, you know, those, those were the original, if you will, three escape playbook uh, tools that corporate entities used. And now, of course, in the age of globalization, and here again, this was, I think, you know, it was sort of teased in the film, but could have been focused on a lot more, which is at the global level, and there's you know, some attention and it was good to see some attention given to what's going on globally with movements and people getting elected and all. But my God, the corporate entities are using their power to define and to govern and to rule through these misnamed international trade deals. They're not about trade, whether it's GATT, TPP, NAFTA at a bi-level or a multinational level. It has nothing to do with trade, be it free or fair. It's about corporate governance, who rules, who decides, and the mechanism for doing that are, if you will, the super duper Supreme Courts called investor state dispute settlement panels, ISDS, as opposed to ISIS, ISIS, easily confused, not ISIS, ISIS, it's ISDS, investor state dispute settlement panels. These are kangaroo courts, made up of corporate attorneys that meet in secret. And when a law at a nation state level is deemed too harsh by you know, an international transnational corporation, they can say, you are you know, uh, violating an international trade agreement. We're gonna take it to this court and this court rules again in secret. And when they decide there's no mechanism for appealing, that's it. So this is the ultimate form that even, dare I say, you know, preempts or trumps a Supreme Courts at a nation state level. So, you know, it was, was really, you know, they didn't touch on that as a governing mechanism that, you know, for all the Occupy movements, for all the resistance efforts out there, you know, there's gotta be some attention paid. And fortunately there is, you know, there are more people paying attention and resisting these misnamed, again, misnamed, they aren't trade deals, they're corporate rule governing deals. Wow, yeah, I'm glad you yeah, brought that up and it brings to mind another thing that I thought about in the film that maybe was, uh, was a little lacking is they leave us with thinking that, well, electing the right people 
it's going to solve the problem for us there. And sure, it, it, it helps and we have to do some things about trying to promote better candidates, but don't they already have to work within this rigged system? and that constrains them and like you mentioned there's there's just so many powers that be and the influences and and so many things else so uh you know what what other things it, i and i think about democracy that makes it sound like okay our solution is just electing the right people but democracy demands that we all participate so we have to come up with other ways to participate and uh, the um, uh, activist Anand uh, Giridhar, I forget how I pronounce his last name, um, at the end he says that you need to be part of unrigging the rigged system. And that's what you're talking about here. So what are, what are some of the things that you think that uh, people can do, uh, obviously helping with supporting uh, movements like uh, Move to Amend and pushing and challenging these things uh, through other moves like community rights and rights of nature any other thoughts yeah well i mean quite right he said you know you got to de-rig a rig system uh absolutely and i mean i i think ultimately i mean are we not talking about figuring out how to build a powerful movement that is um going to bring change and i've always thought social change involves really there's that magic number again three factors one is you have to oppose what is going on out there that is so horrible. I mean, that involves, you know, reacting, responding, resisting, all of those things in which we're firefighting. You got to do that. Uh, but in the course of doing that, the second thing you have to do is you've got to promote alternative policies and structures and institutions that are fundamental, that are dealing with the problems in the, in the equivalent scale and proportion to the problems we're dealing with. And so if some of those problems can be addressed solely and exclusively through legislation, then great, focus most of your attention on electing better people. And we always need to elect better people. That's fine, that's dandy, that needs to happen. But that's just a piece of what needs to happen. Yeah. And it's not a real big piece, actually, if, again, they are boxed into this system that limits what they can do. And, you know, obviously you've got to change those rules and rules in our society are not laws. They're not regulations. They are constitutions. And at an international level, they're trade agreements. So it's like dealing with that. So part of that is, yeah, we do need better people because it's going to be better people who ultimately, you know, you know, social movements in the past have always had an inside and an outside strategy. So we, you know, we do need some friends who can stomach being in, you know, legislative uh, battles inside Congresses and state Supreme Courts and city halls who are voting for, you know, the right thing and are voting for constitutional amendments and those kinds of things, voting for and against things. So yeah, we need that. But we also need to build movements. And part of the movement is, you know, that's part of the alternative. But then the third piece is we need, and this is where I think the work that simply living and others, and it's pointed out in the film of, you know, the coronavirus this past year created just this huge explosion, both in this country and abroad to mutual aid networks of, of helping people meet immediate needs that right now the state is not doing. You know, this is what got the Black Panther Party in so much trouble. It wasn't just that they were talking about, oh, you know, we need sort of a revolution. They were feeding people, right? They were having a breakfast program, feeding inner city young people while they were talking about system change and, and helping people understand and getting on the other side of the learning curve of social movements. And so these three things together, resisting the horror, horrendous things going on second, building social authentic movements and part of that is electing better people but third is helping people right here and now my gosh if we can create some kind of system that has all three of these components in it watch out mm. yeah that brings to mind the words edu educate agitate organize uh <laughs> that uh had, had been used in the past for like union movements and uh, i think it actually it was an indian politician who first coined those words. Um, 
uh, one uh, let me ask one more thing and then uh, take a couple questions from the uh, audience here and uh, I know we've got one from Chuck too um, that we we need to think big about these big problems and start having these conversations I, I'm sure you would agree and like the film uh, suggests that somebody suggested that we need to dream again and and decide what we really want not just accept uh, the way things are and hope for better uh and that brings to mind like during our very first film uh what is democracy uh the filmmaker astra taylor said that hope is a discipline uh you know isn't that one of the reasons that we keep doing what we're doing because uh we just to have hope means you have to act on it there if you really are going to uh do something about that. When I think about dreaming big and imagining, instead of just accepting that box that we have, what we really need in our communities, and you mentioned mutual aid and, and local, I think is a, is a big uh, thing there. And uh, I just wanted to touch on, also we need to examine our constitution. Um, I have people, it's so revered that it's hard for people to do that. Uh, but we have such things as like the commerce clause and the contracts clause clauses and uh, haven't they set the stage really that property rights are above people's rights because of those things in our constitution and you sp I speak about that we're exactly right and um you know Seldif has done uh, just tremendous work in trying to deconstruct and bring to the fore the issue you know this this kind of uh, third rail of wow when you start talking about property oh my gosh uh, you're going to turn people off you're just going to uh, you know alienate people they won't listen anymore but you know we have to have a healthy discussion about uh, what is property and the different kinds of property you know personal property versus the property that's been sort of absconded by saying by paying 10 cents per thousand acres you know i should have my company the right to mine whatever mm -hmm. Where I want out, you know, whenever and whatever is left, that's for others. You know, the externalities, that's for others to sort of deal with. Uh, I mean, that's a different kind of quote unquote property. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so, Isn't that like you know, the commons too, Greg? Yeah, the whole notion of the commons, which again, for most of human existence was considered to be sort of the given, the default. And so, yeah, we do need to envision something very different and that's part of it right part of the power and i think one of the items in the playbook was being able to control the narrative control how people think and what they think and that can be very dangerous when to the powers to be when as author Catherine schultz says the miracle of your mind isn't what you can see the world as it is it's that you can see the world as it isn't mm. and of course if you can see the world as it isn't it invites what it could be instead of the present. And that can be quite dangerous in the eyes of the powers to be, because now all of a sudden you have people with not just hope, but people who are strategizing and thinking about how in the world are we together? You know, it's fine to have hope and dream and all, but let's face it, the other side strategizes <laughs> all the time. They do. And we are about as, you know, uh capitalistic as can be on the on the left in which we're all doing our own things we hardly ever sort of come together and conspire if you will and figure out how we can you know maintain our sort of personal whatever it is but more importantly to come together and figure out how strategically to deal with this mm -hmm. which involves yeah okay maybe a piece of that five percent ten percent whatever should be elections fifteen percent twenty percent building movements, maybe 50%, given the urgency of where we are, should be doing direct action. Mm -hmm. I mean, my God, that's what Greta Thunberg and others are saying, that we've got to literally, uh, let's think about this again, given the urgency of where we are, the scale of the problems, where does that fit in? And we've got to get beyond the notion of what, you know, the Moral Monday movement now, and uh, what uh, the Poor People's Campaign is including direct action. And most of those those uh, movements that were pointed out and near the end of the film of things that have happened in the past, every single one of them involved to some extent doing direct action, not just mm. symbolically protesting, not just doing economic boycotts, 
but actually physically resisting, mm. putting your body on the line and trying to prevent, trying to gum up the system in one way or another. Yeah. Uh, just one more thing that I wanted to, that's a big part of the film, and then I promise I'll take the, uh, the questions here from the audiences. And you mentioned, and I wanted to bring it up, capitalism. There's another thing we have to think big about, that we accept it, the, that it's just the way it is and whatever. Well, it's, it's kind of evolved into this crazy system. And again, part of that dreaming and imagining is what's a better world look like? And is it, can it really exist? And uh, like the one person in the film was talking about, well, uh, corporations need to be committed to people, planet and profits. Well, can they really be com committed to people and planet when profits is really the name of the game? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is absolutely a, a, a fundamental question needs to be asked. Mm -hmm. now, I think there is something to be said, you know, um, around the issue of scale. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, scale in which the ability, you know, even if you look at uh, the Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith, right? I mean, the people on the right, it's their Bible. Adam Smith even talks about um, uh, the ability of capital and the problems of capital, something like half dozen times. The problems of capital, are he associates, most of them are associated with the ability to move. When the, when the ability of capital is free to move, you've got serious problems because now it is completely detached from, you know, people being able and in, in, in structures, public structures, from being able to hold capital accountable. Yeah. Um, and because they can start playing off, right? Corporations start playing off one community, one state, one nation at a time. I'm not sure that, you know, the local hardware store that's trying to turn a buck, okay? I mean, they are operating as a capitalist system, you know, I'm not so sure that they are really at the center of what is so problematic in our society. Mm -hmm. I don't. There's yeah. got to be some something figured out uh, yeah. in which we deal and recognize that there is something to be said about scale. Yeah. And there is also something to be said about the other main model out there, state-sponsored socialism, which ain't too great in terms of what it has done in terms of plundering the planet in terms of thinking about unending growth in a different way um, because they've got their oligarchs these days in uh, the Chinas and in the Russias and in other parts uh, of uh, uh, the world that I know China has gone more, uh, you know, uh, uh, capitalistic, but, you know, there are problems with these systems that are large again, that maybe what we're dealing with as we envision a different world is something in which nation states need to become much smaller mm. in scale that are much more sort of connected to, I don't know, ecosystems or something that is parallel to the natural world mm. instead of these lines that are drawn, you know, straight and made squares or triangles or, you know, perpendicular, whatever the case may be totally divorced from the natural world, from indigenous people, cultures, and the like. There's a lot of rethinking that needs to happen. Yeah, I like that. That's uh, maybe we uh, see a comment uh, there that, uh, um, that we should govern maybe by bioregions. And I think that our two organizations, Simply Living is a lot about the local economy and you mentioned scale that's really important when we're talking about corporations we're talking about these big powerful institutions not about mom and pop stores and local uh businesses really well let me get to um some of the other uh questions posed here well one is uh to live simply we need to know a lot of complex things food energy transit consumption etc the global economy of late stage capitalism, colonialism, imperialism, and neoliberal economics is responsible for most of the ills described in the film. Uh, waking up to income equality and climate change are driving opportunities to push for radical systems change. Uh, new economics, new leaders, political leaders, recognizing the rights of nature, et cetera. Uh, what do you think about localization as the antidote uh, for example, local food systems, community energy, transit, 
reduce consumption, public banking, et cetera? It has its place, no question about it. And I think, um, you know, you're seeing um, particularly younger people gravitate, you know, they think a lot of younger people, whether it was the uh, US social forum in Philadelphia or Detroit uh, held over the last couple of years, or there's, there's you know, all of these movements, uh, networks of local people around uh, uh, symbiosis uh, movement elsewhere, people who have sort of said, you know, the macro system break is so fixed. I, you know, I just, I don't have the energy. I don't have the patience. I don't think really we can expect a whole hell of a lot of change uh, to focus. So I'm going to focus at the local level where I think I can create, you know, where I can put my fingerprints on yeah. things. And I think there is something to be said for that. But I think, again, in proportion, if you ignore the yeah. power of the corporate entities at the state level, federal level, or international level, all the systems, all the things that you may create, even going so far as collecting water off of your rooftops to, right, to, to water your farm, will be deemed at one point or another, and has been, as that example, one of many, will be deemed illegal. Yeah. Uh, so if you just forget about dealing with these other entities on their you know, proportionate scale, we've got to have some kind of way to address and, and how we build accountable, you know, quote unquote, democratic institutions. It's tough yeah. and, you, and it's, it's never static, right? It's always going to be organic. It's yeah. always going to be messy. It's always going to be imperfect. That's, and it's always going to be chaotic, always. That's just the nature of what we're dealing with. Right. But I think we have to at least mentally come to the understanding that we just can't, you know, no man or woman is an island. You just can't focus solely on the local mm -hmm. and ignore because these entities, look what they've done very successfully. They've trumped or, or preempted the local by the state. They've preempted the state to the federal. They preempted the federal to the global and now you've got these people right that are flying off to potentially other planets to try to colonize them and it's not i think whether it's bezos or musk or anybody else it's not about them uh, setting up some colony for them it's about them setting up colonies for us mm. to create these new kinds of places where you can send off people just like the brits you know, sent off all the criminals to Australia uh, and, you know, the like. And that's what they're trying. They want to, you know, create industrial stuff and treat people like serfs and create this, you know, intergalactic set of rights, quote unquote, which will, you know, insulate them throughout the galaxy and to hell with people having any rights because they won't even be on planet Earth. So that's, I mean, that's down the road, obviously. But darn it, that is on their minds. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, when you uh, mentioned that, that we have to work local, but we also have to real recognize those powerful forces that are keeping us, like, for instance, in our community rights movement, where we try to pass community bills of rights. Some of them have passed, but many of them have been, like you mentioned, uh, we're fighting preemption, so we can't have the sustainable communities we want, the local self-governance that the, the U.S. is supposed to be uh, about. Uh, that not that democracy? But we don't really have it. Uh, and um, uh, we 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 have all of these uh, these powers against that there. So we 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 have to also look at that that system that's preventing us from getting it and helping people see that vision for something better. So I, I hear you yep. there. But um, local is the greatest place to form community, physical yeah. community, which is really important to mm -hmm. maintain one sense of. Of, of self, of giving support, mutual support, mutual aid, it, it's a critical piece. Yeah, and one thing that we've experienced, uh, our, community, uh, our uh, community rights groups in Ohio is all three branches of government have acted against us. And so that shows that uh, the, the, you know, the, the whole system really needs a major overhaul because we're, we're having, it's, it's a real fight, like you said, Dimashi, to get what we want. Uh, yeah, Chuck. Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, I think it's a both and situation. I certainly agree that uh, 
corporations are not people. We need to change at the structural system level in terms of those rights. Uh, I think also people need the, the vision, uh, something they can do. Is part of, when you form a community around local food, uh, that's, Greg mentioned the community aspect of that. You feel like you're actually doing something which makes a difference. If you're starting an organic homestead in your backyard, uh, you're doing something. If you're envisioning what uh, some states have been very effective, like Minnesota, been the leader in community solar, getting neighborhoods uh, connected, not depending upon large utilities, but doing it at the community level. You feel like you're engaged if you're building that. Uh, and community around uh, transit, recognizing, and, and again, simply living the short version of our work is community education for sustainable living. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you deconstruct all of these ideas, uh, that's the deeper education you need in order to keep poking at the corporate dragons. Uh, they're out there, and but building a new model uh, and forcing the, the conflict between big ag, which even big ag is now starting to talk about, uh, you know, regenerative farming. They're kind of co trying to co-opt that. And I thought the film was brilliant in presenting direct comments from p the corporate leaders who believe in the, the stuff they <laughs> believe in that they're going to, and then splicing in Chris Hedges and uh, uh, the head of public citizen, et cetera. I thought those were very effective way to to comment on that. Yeah, it, yeah, good point. I agree with you totally, Chuck, that people need something to work in locally as well. And that's how they build some community. And, and also then they've got an organization to take it up higher and get involved in, and start uniting. Uh, the all the dis, you know the different groups that we have here like that but let me get to the next question from the audience here so the film uh, recommended people to get involved in electoral politics and to even get elected it made it sound like this is a new idea there's a long history of this tactic unfortunately many progressive elected officials have succumbed to the pressures of compromise in order to get projects funded or policies passed how can uh common outcomes be, uh, uh, how can this common outcome be avoided in a way that has not been tried and failed before? Any ideas on that one? Well, I think a very important point that was raised uh, maybe by the Seattle people <clears throat> or somebody, you know, there's all kind of comments that are made to keep them straight is, you know, number one, I think the, the very best people who are elected and remain true to their values and to the interests of the community rise from the community so they aren't you know retreads who all of a sudden say oh okay you know sort of sticking my finger in the air pg all of a sudden people are against um uh getting money from corporate PACs so even though i've taken money in the past from corporate PACs i'm just going to become a chameleon now and re-identify myself you know you don't know what you're getting with that kind of person because their history and their legacy isn't authentic. So number one, I think it's really important to try to, where there have been active movements for the people who are willing in those movements to say, okay, you know, I'm willing to stomach or hold my nose or whatever to run for office. Um, I think those are people who, are, who represent the best opportunity not to be co-opted, not to be bought off, not to be intimidated. But, and when they're in there then, if elected, then it it is important that they circle back and be as I like the verb interwoven. Mm. I mentioned to be interwoven with the movement. You know whether it's the fifteen dollar an hour wage or in Barcelona the woman who you know became mayor of Barcelona who rose up uh, by resisting putting literally her body on the line uh, to prevent uh, uh, people from being evicted from their homes yeah. so it's extremely important because we know right we all know of people who may have been legit when they were elected but boy over time you get in those circles and all of a sudden you think wow maybe i do belong here and you just are not as connected to community it becomes so simple because it takes work yeah. to double back and be connected to community you got to spend a lot of time you have to you know take your lumps 
by being criticized for selling out. Uh, I mean, that makes you accountable. So, and there may be some legitimate reasons why some people think you shouldn't have run. Yeah. But I think to be um, authentic in that way, you've got to, you know, be interwoven to the community. And part of that then is when you're in that seat, to use that as a bully pulpit, to say things and to suggest things that are really trying to, you know, to, to, to raise the flag on issues that the community is focusing on, mm -hmm. to use your, your position uh, as an opportunity to call for hearings, to speak at rallies, but also to introduce legislation. You know, doesn't have a chance of being passed, but is an excuse to 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 have it introduced and to get some publicity from that. Yeah, yeah, I agree totally. It seems to me that the officials have to have the mindset that, look, I'm going to do the right thing, and and even if I don't get reelected, uh, it's okay. But I got to hope that somebody else like me is going to come along and fill my place there. Because if you get into that pattern of worrying about winning your next uh, election solely and compromising your values too much, then you become that career politician and, and you're just going to try to save your job rather than save the communities and the people that you represent there. So it seems to me that that's a hard thing because so many of them become that they, they want to remain in that power there, if you mentioned. Yeah, and you get, get sucked so into the culture, get sucked yeah. into that culture. Oh, yeah, it's easy to. Yeah. And, and when you mention about also good leaders, it makes me think about some of those people from the corporations. Maybe, like they mentioned, uh, what was his name, Brown, uh, that maybe he really believes in making the world a better place and all. Uh, I'm not so sure about all of them there, like Bezos and all, but maybe some of them do. But it seems that somehow inside, it, it just gets changed. It's it's it, they get co-opted again and, and they justify maybe what they're doing and, and the little kind of uh, <laughs> ways to make it sound like they're doing good to make themselves feel better that it's not really happening. <laughs> yeah. uh, let me get to the uh, another question um, that uh, uh, Greg's comment about the lack of focus in the film on eliminating corporate personhood is key to our future as a nation, human race and the planet. We will not achieve that objective until every organization seeking to reduce corporate influence and the impact of money in politics, in addition to working on their key issue, whatever it may be, also uh, come together to support the amendment proposed by Move to Amend to eliminate corporate personhood, money and speech. Why would such organizations not add this objective to their individual priorities? Uh, so this is from Michael Greenman, who's a moderator uh, for former moderator, the Move to Amend Interfaith Caucus there, I guess. Hey, Michael. Yeah, good question. Michael's been a stalwart for many a year, actually many a decade uh, around this issue. And I just shameless self-promotion posted in the um, chat if you're interested in signing the Move to Amend motion to amend calling for the 20th Amendment. There's a link to do it. Yeah, you know, it's a good question. You know, we often say, you know, a lot of people say, make this your second issue, whatever your first issue is, make mm -hmm. this your second issue. I really don't think that's the way to look at it. This is not trying to change sort of what the amendment's trying to do. It's trying to change the rules of the game in one way. That's not an issue. That's a strategy. So yeah. issues are sort of, you know, vertical. Changing, changing the rules of the game are horizontal. But if you change the rule of the game in this way or some other ways, that's going to make it easier on all the individual issues we care about, whether it's, you know, all the privatization. And, you know, there was just a boatload in the film of examples of how corporations have privatized or I think more descriptive corporatized issue after issue after issue. The one actually I think they left out that I think is extremely important that may dwarf all the other issues is the corporatization or privatization of money creation by banks when they issue loans out of thin air as debt instead of following article one section eight of the constitution which coins and that word coin is meant as a verb the government has the power to coin money 
It has the exclusive power, but that has been privatized or corporatized. And so it's no wonder why, in my mind, banking corporations, financial corporations are far and away the most powerful, potent, anti-democratic set of corporate entities out there. When you can create money, that's pretty powerful out of thin air is debt. So anyway, you know, all these other issues are sort of, you're going to get much further along if you can change the rules of the game. And certainly that's what CELDEF and Community Environmental Rights Network is trying to do and what Move to Men is trying to do to a certain extent, those folks out there who are working on other constitutional amendments are trying to change the rules of the game. Some may be more important than others, but they all have a place, they all have a role. And I hope uh, Tish at some point puts into the um, uh, chat, uh, maybe it's too early, maybe it isn't, the link to the conference coming up that, um, uh, that CELDEF uh, is taking the lead in, in organizing for an, the end of next April that's going to sort of address how we fundamentally deal with system change. Because that's yeah. the order of magnitude we have to think about. Yeah. Well, yeah, Tish, sorry if I didn't see your hand before. I don't know if it's been up for a while there. So, yes, everyone, it's Tish O'Dell, the Ohio organizer for, and Ohio Community Rights Network member uh, for CELDEF. Uh, Go ahead, Tish. Hey, th well, thanks. And Greg, I, that isn't why I raised my hand. But yeah, well, everybody, now that you signed up for the film and this webinar, you're now on our email list. So yeah, you will get that link <laughs> well, great. It's about the joint conference we're working on. But what I wanted to do was bring up something and people who know me, those, not all of you do, but some do know that I can tend to be, you know, controversial. Um, and this is not probably maybe going to be popular, but for everyone, but you can't talk back to me right now either, but and I'm just kidding here. But they did bring it up in the film. They, you know, I was glad to see that they brought it up through COVID, you know, in the COVID issue, because it's a huge issue. And there's some very disturbing um, things that I see going on. And it's funny because I heard Chris Hedges actually talk about this um, in a video clip I watched last night too. And a big thing they bring up is about how they try to divide the people and getting us to turn on each other where the corporations tend to stick together. And, you know, so right now with COVID, you see them really trying to fragment the population into, you know, the vaccine, not the vaccine, and, you know, really polarizing that whole issue. And yet what we know about corporations and what we've all watched in this film is there's a deep mistrust and it's about money and what a lot of people don't realize some of those people we want to polarize it and say they're all that those people, you know, the, that party, but they may also have a reason and they other people may not realize too that they're censoring, which is very disturbing treatment options. So just like we're saying it's a multi prong approach to movement building, those all set up red flags. So what I'm saying is this is just a single issue and I'm not taking a position one way or the other, but when you look at the system and what you see, and so next month it could be a different issue, but when you see things of like squashing doctors and researchers who have a different opinion saying there's treatment options and the system says, no, absolutely not. And we're censoring those things. We only have this one way we're going to go. And we know there's big multinational corporations behind these. Um, and they're trying to really polarize the people. So these are things I'm just saying, it's a current example. And I'm just saying, you know, like next week it could be, you know, water privatization, whatever, but you look for those same kind of things to send up red flags to go, wait a minute, what, are, what what's going on here? And so I just wanted to get that out there. Yeah, well, that's really true. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 th I think about um, that disaster capitalism. When anything happens, they're there to profit and benefit from it, so no matter what it is. And the pandemic, as we've seen, the great explosion of profits is. is mm -hmm. And they use fear. I mean, they use fear a lot of times. That comes back to the Naomi Klein shock factor and thing. I mean, they did it after 9 11, weapons mm -hmm. of mass destruction, making us afraid of all Muslim, you know, that whole thing. You know, they use this same strategy playbook over and over. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to, one other thing that, oh, unless you had something else to say there, Greg, sorry. Well, just real quick, you know, who's doing that squashing, or should I say not who, but what, is big tech, right? Big tech. And it was pointed out, I mean, there was a section in the film I thought was very good, is among, you know, companies now that are having a disproportionate 
degree of power over what we think and what information is available is big tech. And in a sense, when it comes to issues like, oh, let's, you know, marginalize people who, uh, let's, you know, sort of squash people's First Amendment right to free expression, um, they are, they have become the arbiters of that. Now, we may think, oh, it's great because they're keeping out people of a certain ilk that we may not like that are talking about, you know, the insurrection and the like, but the tables have been turned against people on the left as well for a long time. And this is setting a very dangerous trend. And you know what? The powers to be who are elected, elected officials generally don't mind this because to take on the issue of First Amendment is a pretty tricky one when it comes to what is First Amendment? Because again, First Amendment is sort of, again, one of these sacred things that we don't even ever seriously question, but yet there are already limits in our society to First Amendment. You can't, you know, be in your front yard at 3 a.m. and read from the Declaration of Independence, right? So that's not, I mean, you don't have the right to do that. There is certain noise ordinances and zoning ordinance and the like, and you, you don't have the right to show up to your city council and demand to speak for an hour. You know, there's certain limits Mm -hmm. on that. And so rather than Congress having that discussion of how do we draw the lines and where do we draw the lines and maybe where we draw the lines works for the next six months or a year, but then we'll have to draw the lines again. Let's just wipe our hands clean and let the private do it, the privatization of it. Yeah. Very disturbing. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have just uh, maybe about four minutes left, but uh, first of all, let me, uh, b before I ask my uh, last questions or let you have any last minute uh, thoughts is to remind everybody, if you didn't get a chance to donate for the film series, it does cost us money to uh, put on these films. And also if you'd like to support uh, the work of our organizations, uh, the Ohio Community Rights Network and Simply Living, uh, maybe the links will be there in the chat. So uh, please do so. And uh, we're going to have one more film, at least in our film series that's coming up in October, uh, late October. Uh, we'll have the details, more details up real soon. Uh, it's the People versus Agent Orange, extremely powerful film. And we are very lucky to have the executive director and one of the two uh, women activists in the film, uh, Carol Van Strom. They're going to be on the Q&A for that. So that takes place on the 24th, October. And uh, so you'll be able to watch the film before that. Uh, just one thing that I wanted to mention that also in the film, they bring they they do have a lot of scenes with natives native peoples in the film and that's what, another thing that uh, the like uh, some of the community rights movement and all and I think all of us can learn about how uh, native people have learned to uh, live sustainably with the earth and and create uh, a society that benefits all and look for future generations. Uh, you, any any thoughts on that or any last minute thoughts, Greg, that you didn't get a chance to, to mention? Well, we have a lot to learn from indigenous people, cultures, movements, um, ways of living, ways of, um, of um, deciding um, and figuring out ways in which their voices take on a disproportionately important role in leadership positions in going forward. Because, you know, when we talk about building a quote unquote, democracy movement, that's not just sort of ends, it should be means as well. It's not just a goal, it should be how we operate, not just what we try to accomplish, but how we operate. And those individuals and groups that have been historically oppressed, and indigenous people, people of color, women, uh, people of different sexual orientations. And of course, you know, in the film, it talks about how many of those movements, many of those efforts have been whether it's greenwashed, if it's environmental movement or pinkwashed, whether it's uh, uh, the um, gay, lesbian, uh, trans, uh, sexual movement, whether it's blackwashed, if you want to call it that, uh, Black Lives Movement, you know, the corporate entities are always trying to co-opt those. We have to make sure that uh, that does not happen by, in part, making sure that our movements 
lift up and place in uh, prominent roles those voices, those individuals, those ideas, those uh, strategies. Yeah. So just the last thing to say as I post in the chat, a link to an article on this whole power of you know, handing over as we have handed over uh, oftentimes willingly uh, powers uh, to be you know, the, the pro-corporate legislators. Uh, we privatized everything and we're privatizing, if you will, First Amendment. So there's a piece uh, in Truth Out you may want to take a look at. And then uh, I do operate uh, and put together and release weekly a democ real democracy and monetary history calendar. Feel free. It's free. Both of them, uh, if you want to get either Sunday morning and or Monday morning, those calendars, um, those are the links to sign up. Other than that, thanks so much for taking the time it's to be on here. And uh, feel free to reach out to me individually. I'll put my uh, email in the chat. If you have any comments, uh, questions, uh, queries, anything that you want to challenge, whatever the case may be. And thanks again so much to the Ohio uh, um, work for um, this program. And Simply Living, uh, also thank you. And thank you so much, Greg. Uh, it's been a pleasure, a lot of great thought and ideas. Thank you for sharing. And we really appreciate you taking the time. And we uh, I've learned a lot. I certainly learned a lot uh, from, from your thoughts there. And uh, let's keep keep working. Let's keep uh, keep trying to get a better world there. So thank, thank you, uh, Chuck and, and, and Greg and Tish, all four. And thanks everybody else for joining us. And we look forward to you signing up uh, for our next uh, film. So we'll have details about that shortly. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Bye. Greg. Bye.